So welcome back. This is a question and answer session and I'm uh, replying to the question that was made by one of you, uh, not in the main course uh, chat but uh, privately. So I'm rebounding this into this uh, series of questions and answers because I think it could be of interest of many. So this is a question specifically for uh, those of you who are also taking quantum field theory. So if you're not taking quantum field theory or advanced quantum field theory, or in general, if you're not interested in high energy physics, probably this is not of your direct interest. So in quantum field theory, uh, people tend to avoid making um, loop integrals finite by explicitly putting a cutoff lambda, the way we do. So the way we have done in, in, in the course is anytime we saw a cutoff like this, sorry, a divergent diagram, for instance, the the one with log p times m square that we discussed when we look at uh, uh, the, the uh, Ginsburg corrections, and explicitly by introducing by hand, um, if lambda is a momentum scale, then it would be like p square over 2 lambda square cutoff. For instance, um, in quantum field theory, uh, normally diagrams are not made finite by introducing a cutoff. Mm, for a number of technical reasons, uh, mostly because uh, there are ways of putting regularization that break, for instance, gauge symmetries uh, explicitly. So, in order to make uh, finite diagrams, that you might break gauge invariance, for example, uh, which is something you don't want to do. Uh, remember gauge invariance. Remember charge conservation or it's a fundamental symmetry. Well, there, there are technical reasons why people instead try to use different scheme based on dimensionless parameter to avoid introducing an explicit cutoff. Um, so for instance, one of the methods that is used in quantum field theory is so-called dimensional regularization. Uh, there's another one very commonly used that is the Pauli-Villar schemes. But the Pauli-Villar schemes does have a mass scale. Uh, but dimensional regularization does not, and the idea is very simple, and it's based on noting that most of the diagram that you encounter in quantum field theory uh, can be UV convergent uh, when you change the dimensionality from, say, 4, which is the natural dimension in quantum field theory, to some d. And, you know, the convergence of an integral, of course, depends on the dimensions, right? If you have 1 over p squared, that's clearly convergent in one dimension at the, uh, sorry, 1 over root at infinity. But in in, in, in three dimension, it's not because the, okay, because you get trivially a, a Jacobian in the form p squared dp, which of course does not make this object convergent. So the convergence of an integral depends on the number of dimension. And in quantum field theory, people typically take um, things become divergent at exactly four dimensions. So what people tend to use is to, this is due to Tuft, Graf Tuft, Nobel Prize for Physics in 1998, or 99, I think. Uh, well, whatever. Around, across the year 2000, who actually had this brilliant idea of consider a renormalization scheme you were so look at the diagrams as a function of dimensionality, and then whatever diagrams were there through a method called the Feynman trick, which is a mathematical trick to evaluate this diagram, you will get the results that will depend parametrically on epsilon. You get like gamma functions or whatever functions where epsilon was there. And in the end, of course, you want to take the limit epsilon going to zero, and the idea is to play in such a role that all the dependency of epsilon going to zero, which leads to the infinite numbers, come multiplying effective parameters. For instance, the charge. You know, maybe there's a charge here. You have a charge and then a function of epsilon that goes to infinity times the finite part. And then you would say, when I renormalize, this is my real charge. And I don't have to worry. Like it or not, uh, for many, many years, people didn't like this because it looked like uh, hiding the, the dirt under the carpet. Because you have a function here that goes to infinity, 
a function of epsilon that goes to infinity when epsilon goes to zero, you have a charge, and the whole idea is to say, okay, this quantity is infinite, but I replace it with an infinite with a finite number, which is my experiment, because all this regularization does is to shift by an infinite amount something, and all I measure is the final result. It looks extremely uncomfortable. And I think this sense of uncomfortableness was cleared with the development of uh, modern renormalization group theory, where people began to understand what really renormalization is all about, and and it is about hiding high unknown high energy physics into low energy constants. So uh, I think the point that I want to emphasize is that we probably did not emphasize enough in the simple context of renormalization uh, we look at in the context of statistical mechanics, is that one has, uh, uh, in principle, every theory has a cut of scale, natural cut of scale, when it works. Whether you want to use this cut of scale to make the calculation finite, or you want to use dimensional relocalization to make the calculation finite, you still have to fight with a cut of scale. Let me give you an example. You work in QED, and you want to make your diagrams finite in QED. Then you very happily introduce a dimensional regularization and do your calculations in dimensional regularization in QED. And then in the end of the day, send epsilon to zero, renormalize the coupling, and you get a finite result, even at one loop level. However, QED is not valid at uh, above the grand, uh, the unification electroweak unification scale. At that energies, uh, you know, you have to account for the fact that there is electroweak interactions, and you have to renormalize the standard model, and rather than just QED. So there is a scale beyond which QED alone is not simply there. And very simply, you know, you have a photon that can fluctuate in an electron and positron, for instance. But if you're, you know, if this photon has sufficient energy, then it, this momentum that floats into these diagrams, say this is P, this is Q, this is P minus Q, the momentum Q that floats into this diagram could be sufficiently large to generate, say, a quark anti quark Q Q bar loop, which is not there in QED. So clearly, if you work in QED alone, you don't consider this diagram when you renormalize the theory, you only consider electron positron or muon anti-muon, whatever you, you know. So you do have a cutoff, even though you don't need a cutoff to make diagrams finite. You work with different ways of making diagrams cut -off. So in statistical physics, on the other hand, uh, there is a natural cutoff which has a very clean physical interpretation and is the lattice spacing between atoms. So in statistical mechanics, cutoffs are always there from the beginning and and it's always clear that the, the never go you never should go close to a right or one or two pi over a momentum scale and there usually is no gauge symmetry to worry about or or, or, or other features like that to worry about so in statistical mechanics people tend to use cutoff however they sometimes use dimensional regularization and you might use dimensional regularization. And in particular, uh, the Nobel Prize for Polymer Physics to the Jeanne and co-workers uh, was also based on the idea of considering infinite dimensions, because in infinite dimensions, uh, things simplify, and, and then you look at the expansion in, in terms of one over in number of dimensions, and you get, uh, uh, and get some like natural expansion product. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, there's room for other ways of renormalizing the things. But this brings me to an important difference between the regularization scale, the cutoff of your theory, whether you need it to make calculation finite or it's something you need to keep in mind that your theory is not valid beyond that, and the renormalization point, which might be not the same concept in general. So what do I mean? I mean that for things to be uh, meaningful in quantum theory and statistical theory, we discussed that, 
we need to be we need to be physics to be gathered into groups regions where there is a spectral density as are large and then gaps right uh, for instance this is atomic physics then there's a five order magnitude gap and then there's nuclear physics then there's probably a couple of orders one one and a half orders and then there's hadron physics uh, and so on and so on and whenever you write an effective theory which means essentially whenever you write any theory since any theory is an effective theory uh, you need to put a cutoff somewhere in the gap but after you this is simply there to tell you you know I don't worry about nuclei if I'm looking at atoms QED for atoms I don't need to know that the nucleus is finite sized or the protons and neutrons have isospin symmetry just to give you an example however once you know that you choose to perform an experiment at some scale let me call lambda r which is the renormalization scale and the renormalization scale must be chosen in a regime where you are in the gap and you believe your theory so the renormalization scale is usually not very close to the cutoff scale remember what we did at the first lecture we computed the spectrum uh, with our Hamiltonian with this smear delta function remember it was this counter term and what we did did we use to set the constant we set the constant to the lowest energy point because that was the point we trusted the most so the renormalization scale is in the region of fidelity of the theory because that's where you replace constants with experiments or you effective parameters like the QED charge you match it either to experiment which is what typically do people in QED or if you were in if you had like a more fundamental theory which we don't for the electric charge uh, we don't have any structure of the electrons so far but in that case we would replace it with some underlying more fundamental theory so in the case of dimensional regularization you still have in mind your cutoff, but you never use it to make calculation finite. You just keep in mind not to use QED uh, with only electron floating around if you do calculation at many GVs, because your loop will be sensitive to, to quarks and colors in general. But just to give you an example. And you make your calculation finite with whatever techniques you want, maybe dimensional regularization, and you choose a regularization point in the region where you trust your QED with all the electrons. I hope I answered the questions. If you have any more questions, please ask. Bye-bye.